So a little bit about Alfresco and our success. We were started back in 2005 by the former founder of Documentum. And uh, we're currently the largest open source content management company in the world with over 2,300 enterprises in 75 countries um, using our enterprise edition um, content repository. With over 6 million users and 3.3 billion files, um, that just points to the success we've had in, um, in taking our technology and enabling our customers with great solutions. And solutions that uh, have been developed by an active community with great partners like Bluefish, who will be presenting a little bit later today. Uh, next slide, please. This slide's just the uh, uh, just a shows a showcase of a, a handful of our of our customers. Um, a lot of brand names that you interact with and know every day um, uh, leverage Alfresco to house their most um, important content. The interesting thing is that over 70% of them have over 10,000 employees. So we have a wide diversity of customers that um, that leverage our solution, and the solution provides a great a great scale and service to meet the demands of the world's largest companies. Um, with customers in over 75 countries, we have a global organization that can support um, support some of the most demanding customers as well. And we we uh, we span a, a whole range of commercial, government, and NGO, as well as education um, um, organizations that leverage our technology. In terms of the renewal rate, is that since we are an open source technology, um, as a feature of our solution, um, the way that our customers uh, receive support is through an annual support contract. And so 90% of the time, um, those customers are coming back and, and seeing the value that Alfresco delivers through their in their content uh, solutions and are, and are wanting to stay connected to us through a support contract. So it just speaks to the value that we have to uh, deliver year over year in keeping customers engaged. Uh, next slide, please. And now a little bit about the platform. Um, recently, we announced uh, uh, an offering called Alfresco One, and what Alfresco One is is really an integration of the best of the best of Alfresco. And so it starts at core with Alfresco Enterprise, which is an on-site, robust, modern um, enterprise content management platform. Um, it's focused on scalability, usability, and it has many great features that uh, that you would need in building a, um, a content repository, including a document management, um, the place for document management and team collaboration. Um, it provides rich media support. Um, we do digital asset management and web content services, so you can use uh, Alfresco to uh, to de deliver just a, uh, to be able to house really pretty much any type of content within your organization. We also have a records management console, and so for regulated industries and folks with content that needs to be um, that needs to be handled as a record, we can handle that as well. Now we've taken the best of Alfresco Enterprise and we've cloud enabled it and so we have a, a, a service offering where you can collaborate with your content in the cloud. And uh, you can do that today by going to alfresco.com and, uh, and registering for a cloud site. The benefit of this is that it provides um, document management and a great deal of collaboration um, for uh, your internal as well as external vendors. And so if you have customers and partners, business partners or contractors that need access to content, Alfresco Cloud is a secure way for people to share and to collaborate on documents. With all the great version, with all the great attributes that you'd expect from a platform, so version control and metadata and things like that. The great news about Alfresco, though, is that enterprise and cloud are linked together through a synchronization technology. So, um, so wherever your content is, you can you can have that secured in the right place, as well as share it with the folks externally um, that need to have access to it. And the other great part is that we have a mobile app. Um, on iOS available today that you can go and download and, uh, and that provides secure access to um, all of your Alfresco content, whether that be in the cloud or on, on the enterprise. And there's some special security features in there as well too, so, um, so you don't be alarmed at having um, content on your, um, on your mobile applications. There's, there, there's ways that we can lock that down and that, um, that's keeping secure as well. So um, next slide please. And so that's just a little bit about Alfresco, and now I wanted to turn the presentation over to Lisa Hill, where she can provide a, uh, an overview of the solution and, uh, and move forward with that. So Lisa, over to you. Great. Thanks, Joe. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, if you have any problems hearing me, um, please just let Joe know, and he'll jump in, and we'll get the audio situation corrected. Uh, let me take just a moment and walk you through what I plan to cover today. Uh, to give you a little context, Joy is going to spend a few minutes talking about the type of data that Drilling Info works with. In particular, we'll bring you up to speed on their North Dakota data product since it was the development of this product that drove the move to Alfresco. 
Then we'll give you some insight into the particular challenges that Drilling Info's data management team faces. Next, I'll give you an overview of their entire technology solution and let you know how Alfresco fits in that picture and specifically how it's used to overcome all those data management obstacles. And assuming all goes well, we'll even try and save a few minutes at the end for some Q&A. Before I jump in, let me take just a moment and uh, tell you a bit about Bluefish and Drilling Info. Who's Bluefish? We're a systems integrator, um, and we help companies get started and build solutions on the Alfresco platform to address their content management challenges. We're focused exclusively on ECM. It's all that we do, um, and we've been doing it for over 13 years now. We really see kind of two main types of clients. Um, we service both the Global 2000, which, of course, they have complex environments, exacting IT standards. They're global in reach, and they have their own unique set of challenges that come with that environment. But we also service mid, growing mid-market companies. These companies are often outgrowing their current business processes or systems. They might not even have a current content management system in place. Um, a lot of them are moving from paper processes to electronic processes and um, are getting started with that with the Alfresco platform. And one thing that differentiates Bluefish is that whenever possible, we try to deliver our projects on a fixed price basis. And those solutions might range anywhere from an Alfresco quick start, where we get a client up and running quickly with Alfresco, to full turnkey ECM solutions. Uh, but whatever the scope of the project, our number one priority is to leave our clients not only satisfied, but elated with their solutions and their Bluefish experience. So that's Bluefish. Now who's drilling info? Let me turn over to Joy for just a minute and uh, let her give you some background. Thanks, Lisa. Drilling Info is a company that digitizes information and provides it to the oil and gas industry. We also provide an array of data-driven tools and analysis so that they can make informed decisions on exploration and investment. The company was founded in 1999 by a few friends who worked out of their garage. They focused on just a handful of forms for a single state. Now DI consists of nearly 300 employees and we cover a wide variety of data for 37 states as well as offshore and international. Our data management department alone processes more than half a million documents annually and that number increases every year. As you can see, the data management department, or ADM, went from just under 200,000 forms in 2007 to more than half a million in 2011. And 2012 is expected to surpass even that. Now, half a million forms may not sound like much, but keep in mind that these are highly complex and technical forms. This is just one of the forms the ADM handles. We gather information from multiple sources in multiple states, and no two forms are alike. Of course, the increase in data is partly because of increased activity in the oil and gas industry, but also because we're adding new forms all the time. Case in point, we just recently added North Dakota completion, which we'll take a quick look at now. Here we see the drilling info, ta drilling info table view. When a customer searches on the DI site, this is the screen that they'll see. The screen shows the top tier or basic information for multiple completions. If you drill down into one of the rows on this table, it will take you to the completion page. All the data entered on the completion is displayed in these tabs. That includes everything from who drilled the well, to what equipment was used, to what tests were run. Basically, everything you saw in that form we just looked at is represented on this screen. Now let's take a closer look at the frac stage detail tab. One new feature that we introduced with North Dakota Completion Product was fracture information. You've probably read about hydraulics fracturing in the news. What you see here is the information about the materials and chemicals that were pumped into the well during the process. This was the biggest challenge in the project because of the sheer complexity of the data and the level of detail that's reported. You may be wondering if we had a working system, why we brought in Bluefish and Alfresco. Our internal processes had outgrown our existing system. ADM currently has more than 30 employees and is still expanding. We have a wide variety of experience and skill levels, and our system for ensuring that we maintain a 98% accuracy standard is, out of necessity, complex. Depending on the employee's level of experience, we'll quality check anywhere from 15 to 100% of the data that they enter every day. It would be easy enough to randomly pick some forms out of the 20 to 100 forms that that person entered, but we also use a risk-based QC system to ensure that the data our customers really want to see is what gets checked. Previously, that meant running queries and creating spreadsheets for every employee for every type of form they enter every day. We really wanted a way to streamline this process as well as simplify form creation and entry. We evaluated several options, but in the end, Alfresco was the best match for our needs. Now I'll give you back to Lisa so she can walk you through Bluefish's solution to ADM's challenge. 
Well, thanks, Joy. So before I jump in and um, let you know how the data management team does their job, I want to take a step back and take a look at how Alfresco fits into the total technology solution. Now, you already saw some screenshots of the DI web application. This is the end data product, that thing that companies actually uh, take a look at when they want to figure out where in the world they should be drilling. But data isn't entered directly into that system. Information actually starts its life in what we call the manufacturing system. This is an Alfresco box. Well, it's actually a, a clustered set of Alfresco instances where the ADM team does their data entry and QC activities. And once that data has been captured, it is transferred using Alfresco's replication mechanism uh, to a second Alfresco cluster called the presentation system. Now, believe it or not, it doesn't end there. We actually have a custom REST-based API that's used to extract metadata, metadata from this Alfresco instance and into a series of databases where the data is further processed, analyzed, aggregated, and such that when a user does a search for completion information, they get a high-quality data response and then can, at the same time, get access to the original completion document, which is served directly from Alfresco. All right, so that's the end-to-end -end solution. Now let's take a closer look at the manufacturing system and see how the ADM, ADM team leverages Alfresco for the data entry and QC process. Before we actually take a look at this real system, which is coming, I promise, I want to walk you through the process that ADM follows. As a first step, data is retrieved from the regulatory agency and uploaded into Alfresco. These PDFs are then parsed out to various data entry personnel for indexing, which is to say they're put in their pending folder, pending meaning pending indexing. Now when an ADM member um, sits down to work, they have an indexing queue that points at this folder, and they work documents in that queue, keying all of the information from the form into the system. As they complete each, each form, it's moved off to a loaded folder, and at the end of the day, or when they're finished indexing all the documents in their queue, they can take that entire loaded batch and submit it for quality control. Now, when a user submits that batch, a bunch of magic happens within the Alfresco system to determine not only how many documents actually have to be verified, which it varies depending on the um, kind of training level of the actual data entry personnel, but which of the documents in the batch should be reviewed. Again, that follows that risk-based QC that Joy was mentioning. So based on these heuristics, documents are moved into either a to-verify or a pass-through folder. Now a QC user, someone who's performing that, performing that quality check, can sit down and review documents in that to-verify queue. They approve the documents as they review them, and they're one by one moved off to a published space or replication, then moves it out to the presentation Alfresco instance. Now, once all the documents in the batch that were designated for verification are complete, the rest of the batch is also moved to the published site. Okay, let's take a break from the slides and let's actually take a look at this system. So I'm gonna swap over here. Um, actually, let me give you a little rundown of what I'm gonna, co gonna cover in a, in a demo. We're gonna first perform data entry for a North Dakota completion. Um, we're going to submit the batch of completions to QC for approval and see how the documents are parsed out to the two verify and pass-through buckets. We'll perform QC on the batch and see how documents are published both one by one to the two verify queue and then um, via the pass-through bucket. And last, we're going to actually take a look at some auditing information that's stored on these documents so you can see for any given document who performed the various activities. All right, now, now we're really going to switch over, I promise. So, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to log into Alfresco Share as a data entry user. I'm going to log in as the data entry one. Let me give you a quick little tour of the data entry site and what the document library looks like. You can see that within this document library, I have top level folders. These correspond to each of the various forms that, that are um, captured in the system. I just have a couple that are captured in, in my little dev environment I have here. Now, if I go down and let's drill under the North Dakota completions folder, I can see that in addition to an inbox, I have folders that correspond to each of the various people who actually perform data entry activities for this North Dakota completions form. And if I click on data entry one, that's my user, I can see that I have three different subfolders here. A pending folder that we talked about where documents go for, for indexing, a loaded folder that we mentioned where documents go once they've been loaded, and a four revision folder. And I'll talk more about that one later. So if I take a look in this pending folder, I can see that I have three documents that are in here right now. 
Um, and I could go and I could work with these documents directly in this folder, but I mentioned that we have actually what we call an indexing queue set up to make working with these documents easier. Um, if I go up here at the top of my screen, you can see this indexing drop-down, and I have a queue here called ND Completions Pending. And I can click on that, and you'll notice that I bring up on the left-hand side, I have these same three documents that were in the document library. I have kind of up on the screen um, with a list here on the left-hand side. Um, and then in the middle of the screen, I have a big, um, big set of all of the metadata for this completion. Now, you remember, that was a big form that I showed at, and so we've got a lot of different tabs of metadata here to, uh, to facilitate this data entry. So there's a lot of stuff here. Um, now, when someone's actually performing data entry, they need to actually see the document that they're indexing as well. Well, it turns out that everybody that performs data entry at Drilling Info actually has a dual monitor set up. So what they do is actually use this button up here, and they open this um, document into a new window, and then they, they drag it over onto their other monitor. Uh, it's hard for me to actually demo that um, over, over a WebEx, so you'll just have to take my word for that, that they have that up on the screen. Um, so they're sitting here, and they're actually looking at the document, and then they can go ahead and enter metadata about it. So I'm going to just enter some information right here. Um, I'm not going to do data entry for this uh, uh, all the information because there's a lot of data here and you don't really need to watch me type. Um, but I'm just going to enter the few pieces of kind of required information. Um, I do want to point out this is a cool little feature here. We have this drop down for operator. And now I could interact with it as a classic kind of drop down and see all of it, but it has this neat feature that I can actually start typing things and it actually will filter out just, um, just entities and options in the dropdown that match my selection. Um, this is actually really important to Drilling Info because um, they need to make sure that they have consistency in how the data is entered, but it actually comes in on the form um, and a lot of different things. So they need to be able to kind of start typing that keyword and be able to easily pull kind of from the correct set of values. So once I've kind of completed data entry for a form, pretend I filled out all the fields, it all looks good to me, I hit save, then I hit the submit form button. This is going to actually take this document out of my indexing queue, it's going to move it over to that loaded folder, and it pulls up the next document in the, in the batch. So I can just start typing this stuff, another well, this is all totally inaccurate data. That's all right. We'll just pull up the couple of values that we know that we have to do in order to be able to finish our data entry, save, submit the form. Let's do one more. And completion date, save. All right, submit that form. Now that's it, that's, that was the last item in my queue. Now remember what I said was that each of these documents, as I was doing them, was actually moving from the pending folder into my loaded folder. So if I go and look, now my pending folder is empty, and my loaded folder has both these documents that I just did now, I can kind of look at my time stances here, as well as some that I did um, earlier today. So here's those last three documents that I just loaded. Now that everything has been done, I've kind of done all my data entry on my batch, I want to go and submit that for approval to QC. So if I go back to this view, I can see that, you know, hey, you have these different options on, on documents and, and uh, folders. Well, for this loaded folder, I have a new action that has been added. It's a submit for approval. So I'm going to click on that, and that's going to allow me to submit that entire loaded batch to QC for approval. So that's been submitted. Now, just to prove that, I, that I'm telling the truth, notice everything's gone from my loaded folder. I'm going to switch over now, log out as data entry one, and I'm going to log in as QC. Give you a quick little tour of this QC site. Similar to the data entry site, we have different folders for each of the forms. If I look into North Dakota completions, I see that I have two folders, a verifying, that's where documents go for if they're being verified, and a problem forms folder, 
uh, that's where I send, send forms if I have a problem with it for some reason and they need a more expert person to look at it. Um, if I look in this verifying uh, area, though, I see that, again, I have an entry for each one of the people who performs data entry on the form. And if you recall, it was data entry one that, um, that I had been logged in as before. And you can see that, lo and behold, they have a batch here that they've submitted for QC. I'm just going to drill down to show you what exists what is within here. You can recall that I mentioned there was going to be both a to verify and a pass through folder. And it's according to those heuristics of how many documents have to be verified and, and which documents that they figure out which documents go into which folder. So we can see that I have two documents that need to actually be verified. And there's a batch of eight documents that kind of are going along for the ride in the pass through folder. Now, this isn't actually how people interact with the system. I just wanted to show you how, how this looks. But what people actually do when they're QCing is, again, go to an indexing queue. Now, before, when I was, ha was doing data entry, that North Dakota completions pending was relative just to me. So when I was logged on to is data entry one, I just saw documents that were assigned to me for data entry. But when I'm verifying, a QC person who actually has access to be able to see all the documents and could verify anybody's documents that have been submitted. And, and, but what they really want to do is actually go through kind of a batch at a time to, to do that verification. Um, they want to kind of work on uh, you know, verifying one person set because maybe they're, um, there's a training opportunity, maybe they're making some mistakes. It's just uh, an easier way for them to do that QC. Um, so I can actually use this mechanism right here and scale down, and I want to, I'm going to actually do the QC for that data entry one batch that that um, data entry person just submitted. So I'm going to go down to there, and we can see that, yep, I have those two documents that had been in that manual verification folder. Um, and I can look at this, and I'm going to say, yep, it all looks good, and I'm going to approve it. That document moves out of the queue and brings me to the next one. I can take a look, read all through this. We'll just trust that it's all good this time, and I'll say approve again. So now this queue is empty. Let's go and take a look and see what actually happened to prove to you that the, the documents actually went away. So I'm going to drill back into that QC site, North Dakota completions, verifying, data entry one, and yep, that whole batch is gone. Now, where was it supposed to go? Remember, it's supposed to be actually published now. This is how the document actually gets to a, to a published space so that it can be replicated out to another system for presentation. So I'm going to log out. I'm going to log in as an admin user so I have access to that published space. And here, the document library set up just a slightly bit different. We still have some um, completions uh, you know, in frac detail, some top-level folders. But then they're organized in a kind of date structure. And I can see that if I drill down to today, I can see these documents. Yep, 1227, that was just a moment ago. I have some documents that were, that were moved um, into this area just today. And in fact, if I take a look at one of these documents, I'm going to actually click on this edit, edit metadata so I can bring up kind of a, a wider screen view of this. I can see what I wanted to show you was this tracking information about, about the document. So we can see this is one of these documents we just worked on, and we can see everything that kind of went on with that document. You can see that it was it had data entry by data entry one. They submitted it for QC submission. This was one was queued for pass through, and so it, it passed via that batch, and it says which batch it was a part of. And I can kind of spot check a couple of these. can see that you'll have that, that exact correct information for each one. And one of these will, you know, in here will have actually done, um, done that actual verifying ourselves. So we can kind of see, this is pretty cool to be able to see the full history of a document, um, any given document, who did what, when, where, why, all within this kind of screen. Um, and it's, of course, read-only there. You can't make any modifications. It's just showing up there. All right. So that's kind of the, the base um, QC process. And it always happens just like that, right? Nobody ever makes a mistake. Uh, well, not so. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, even ADM's good, but they're still human. And that's why they have this QC process. 
So what happens when QC finds a mistake in data entry? Well, instead of approving the document, they reject it and send it packing. Where? Well, back to the person who did the original data entry, of course. You know, that way they can not only have them correct the mistake, but they, the person who made the mistake can learn from it. And depending on how many mistakes they've made in a batch, you know, Joy mentioned that they, the DI maintains, uh, the ADM team has to maintain an accuracy rate of above 98%. So if any given batch, the accuracy of that batch falls below 98%, then the rest of that batch is going to be rejected to them as well. Basically, they got to start all over. Um, they, they screwed up enough times in this batch, something went wrong, they, we need to take a look at all of them. Um, so they, they send them all back to them for revision. Now, all these documents end up in a for revision folder. That was that one I, I said we talk about later. And then, you know, you've kind of seen this paradigm now. They end up in the folder. That means there's going to be a for revision queue. Now, they can work these documents just like they work documents out of the pending folder. And when they're done, they can resubmit them to QC just as before. <coughs> so let's go and take a look at how that works. We're going to perform QC on another batch of documents, but this time we're going to detect an error in the document. Now, you saw my data entry. It was not very good. There's actually going to be a lot of errors, but we'll just pretend that there's one. Uh, we'll reject the document. We're going to comment on the reason for the rejection, enter an error code about it, um, and uh, we'll see how it moves from, this, um, from the QC space to the submitters for revision queue. And we'll also see how the remainder of that batch moves there as well. And then we'll take another look at that auditing information and see how we track who rejected it and why it was rejected. All right, let's switch back over to Alfresco. I'm going to log out as my administrator, and I'm going to log back in as QC. Now, earlier I set up another um, batch that I had that I logged in as data entry to, and I had them kind of get a get a batch all set and ready for QC. So I'm just going to go and do review of that dev batch data entry too. And this time we'll take a look at this and we'll say, you know what, um, this looks miserable. The well name is certainly not ADF DAD. Um, <laughs> so we want to we want what we want to do is we want to reject this, but we want to be able to um, do a couple of things. We want to be able to um, first and foremost, we want to be able to train the person in ADM who made the mistake on what they need to do, where they need to focus, how they need to do better, tell them what the problem was that we found. Um, so we use just Alfresco's built-in commenting mechanism for that. It's great to have a little dialogue between two people about a document. So we can add a comment to them and say, like, you know, hey, you messed up the well name. Learn to type. So we can create a comment, and that's added there. Now what's great is this is just internal to the Alfresco system, right? I haven't actually modified the document. So when these documents get published out and are available on the end website, these comments are not going to be there. That's great because this is internal dialogue. You can be honest. You can actually help train the ADM, and it's not actually touching the integrity of the document itself. So super important. Um, so that's the first thing I'm going to do. There's another tab that was along here that was a remarks tab, and ADM has another little thing that they do. Is they actually, they like, drilling info loves data, I just got to tell you. And so they want to track information about anything you can think of. And so they actually have different error codes um, that they write for different, um, for different kind of common mistakes. So we can say error, bad typing. That's not actually a real error code, but it's good enough for our purposes. So they'd, they'd update it with an error code, um, and they would click Save. And then they're going to actually reject this document. So I'm going to click Reject. Now this is going to send that document back to the, um, that for revision queue of the person who, who submitted the document, in this case, Data Entry 2. But wait, there were two items in our queue, right? Well, not only was that item rejected, because I only had 10 items in my batch and one was bad, we instantly fell below that 98% threshold. So the rest of the batch that was in to verify was also rejected, as well as if I actually go and look, drill into here, 
verifying that data entry two folder, notice that everything's gone. So everything that was in the two verify and the pass through, basically that whole batch was rejected. Um, now I'm going to log out and log in as that data entry two user. <clears throat> and notice if I go up here, I have now in, in my North Dakota completions for revision queue, I actually have 10 documents. I have both those documents that had been in the to verify and the pass through documents, all those documents are showing up here for me to revise. And if I take a look at the tracking information on one of these, can scroll down and take a look at this guy, see that it went from data entry two over to QC1, and this one failed QC with error code, error bad typing. This was the one I'd actually done the QC on, and it get, got reassigned to me for revision. So I have that, that kind of information that I had put in the remark actually gets saved into the tracking information for this document. Of course, that error code has been, has been cleared out now, um, so that's not staying into that, in that document because I can do it again and get another error, but it's, it's captured in that tracking information. And I can see in the comment here, like, hey, this is, you know, hey, I messed up on that well name. So I can, I can learn from my mistake. I can correct um, whatever the problems are. I can correct that well name. And then I can click save. And then I can submit that. And that's going to follow again on that whole process that we looked at before. All right. So that's really the completion data entry and QC process in a nutshell. Um, but I did have one more thing that I wanted to show you. Um, and I wanted to talk about FRAC detail forms. Now, while these forms have totally different metadata, they're actually based on the same physical document as the completion. So we've been looking at completions all along. You know, and remember when we first completed data entry on that completion document, you know, it ended up here in that, this loaded folder? Well, what I didn't tell you before was when the completion actually entered this loaded folder, some other magic happened. The system actually took that document, made a copy of it, seeded it with some core metadata from the completion form and filed it in the FRAC detail inbox. So it actually created a whole new instance of a different type in the Alfresco system based upon the same kind of physical PDF document. Now once there, of course, the form can follow the same data entry can QC process um, that we just discussed. So it goes to pending, you enter your data on it, it goes to loaded, you can submit the batch. Now the reason why I actually wanted to bring this to your attention is that the FRAC detail form happens to show off another cool feature that we implemented for drilling info. Remember how Joy mentioned that the most complex part of all this stuff for North Dakota was actually the fracking information? Well, she wasn't kidding. It is complicated. And it's not by the sheer number of fields. The completion itself actually has far more. But it's actually in the way that the metadata is structured. See, this fracking information is organized in what I affectionately call nested correlated repeating attributes. I can just hear all of you going, say what? <laughs> um, let's take a look at the metadata for the frac details so that you can see what I mean. So, frac details or treatments aren't just made up of simple attributes. Um, so, in addition to straightforward things like NDIC number and wellbore ID, they're actually comprised of a number of what are called stages. And they have multiple of them. Now, each stage is made up of its own set of metadata. But most interestingly, you know, in addition to these simple attributes, they're made up of a number of additives and phases. Additives themselves are made up of their own set of attributes. But phases are even more complicated. In addition to simple things like pressures and rates, they're also made up of a number of materials. And each material has its own set of properties. Now, I realize that all these terms probably don't mean much to you unless you um, happen to frack for a living. Um, so let me give you another example that might be a little bit more intuitive. Another, albeit contrived, example. Let's say we're modeling a neighborhood. So in addition to some properties of the neighborhood itself, each neighborhood is made up of one to n houses. 
Each house has properties like number of stories and square feet, but it's also comprised of multiple bathrooms and bedrooms. Now, um, bathrooms and bedrooms each have their own metadata, but bedrooms in turn have closets with more metadata still. Now, this is totally contrived, I get that, but the actual the metadata we are modeling for drilling info was not. And in fact, in this case, the hierarchical relationship amongst those attributes was very important. Now, not only did we need to accurately capture the information, but we also needed to create an easy, intuitive UI in which to capture it. So, I want to take a look and uh, see um, how we did that. So we're going to take a look at that North Dakota frac detail inbox that I mentioned where the documents automatically got created based upon our completions. And we'll see those frac forms that have appeared in that folder. We'll move some over to our pending folder and then we'll actually perform some indexing, noting the metadata that's been carried over from the completion um, before we jump into a big table of stages, phases, and materials, oh my. All right, last time, let's jump back over to Alfresco. So I am going to log out as data entry two. I'm going to log back in as data entry one. And go back to that data entry site. And what I wanted to do was, remember we said we were going to go to the, actually not the completions, but the frac details inbox. And we can see that we have in here a bunch of documents. Um, if I kind of look at this timestamp, you can see these three that are here. These are correspond to those three completions that we actually performed the data entry on. Now, each of these had actually been renamed according to a naming convention that DI files for all their documents and, of course, have a, an extension of FRAC extended, so we know that these are FRAC forms. Just to distinguish them from the completions, which follow a similar naming convention, they happen to be sitting side by side ever. So. What I said I wanted to do was we are going to take all these documents and we're going to move them into, um, we'll put them in my inbox, um, in my pending folder so that we can do some data entry on them. So I'm going to move them on over. And then I'm going to go to my indexing queue. So I look, now I have in my FRAC details pending folder, I can see that I have quite a few documents in here that are ready for me to index. Now, before when I loaded a screen, I basically had most of all this information was blank. But in this case, I actually have information that has been preceded, that's been pre-populated based upon the completion. Because as I said, the actual physical document, if I were to look at this actual physical document, is, is from the completion because the FRAC information actually comes from a, a specific part of the completion some data that has to be interpreted, and then um, sometimes, like in this case, some extended information. So this one has lots and lots of information about the fracking. See, I told you they were complicated. We weren't making it up. So um, I need to be a way to be able to capture all of that information about the stages, the phases, and the materials. Um, and the way that we've done that is with this table that we use see here. So this is a new custom control that we've created. Um, and I can add a new row to it, go like this. So let's just do a little bit of data entry on here. We'll see this is stage number one, lateral one, begin date the second. We don't care about the time. We'll say the fifth, and it was from 1,000 to 2,000. And I can hit tab, hit enter and submit. You know, data entry, being able to not have to use your mouse to be able to just tab through things and do stuff is super, super important to data entry. Um, so it was really important that we have a mechanism that provided this easy access to be able to just type because they're much better at data entry than I am. All right, so I'm just going to enter a couple of those. And we can see that I have now rows populated in this table. But remember, a stage actually contains what? A phase. And so um, it not only had a phase, but it also had additives. So I can then go and enter information in these tables. So let's add one of these phases.
and add just a couple of them just so that we have a couple of rows in our table. Now we have two phases in here, and I could also add an additive. But remember, phases themselves contain additional what? Materials. So if I expand one of these, I can actually add material. And the great thing about this is that all of this is facilitated for easy data entry. So, you know, I'm, I'm actually not that good at data entry, so it takes me a while to, to do all this stuff. But once, once you're one of these trained people, they can actually just use their keyboard and jump around to everything. And we'll add another, like add a profit, so 123 pounds of sand. So you can see that we have all of this information that has entered here, this, these nested kind of tables of information, these correlated repeating attributes, this all captured in one screen for them to do data entry. No relationships are following to other screens or things like that. They can kind of have all the information captured here and, you know, can collapse it to actually see, to drill, to either drill down where they need to or, or see what they need to see. So, if I enter the rest of this required information, everything looks good, and I can save that there. And if I wanted, I can even take a look and see that I have this tracking information for this as well. Um, I can even see, you know, uh, which, which completion form it was actually created from. Um, so I get all of that rich information that I needed to have. So that's all that I had planned to actually show you today. Um, I did want to let you know that if you wanted more information regarding how to actually model tabular data, maybe not quite as complex as that, but um, maybe something a little bit more simpler in your own Alfresco environment, um, I would suggest that you attend our um, session at DevCon in San Jose that's going to be presented by my colleague, uh, Gary Cox. Um, and if you're interested in um, seeing more information about that document indexing module, that indexing thing that we looked at, um, you can actually take a look at a webinar that I recorded earlier in this spring. That URL I know is a little cryptic, so if you have any problems or um, need any other information, um, please just uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, so we have just a couple of minutes for some Q&A. Um, if you have any questions, um, please go ahead and uh, submit those to, to Joe if you haven't already, and he'll um, get them shot over to me. Um, have a couple questions already. Um, let me take a second, try and read those and see if I can answer them. Um, let's see, we have one here that says, what about OCR? Why didn't you use, um, use that? Um, well, that's a great question, actually. Um, Honestly, at the time, we didn't integrate an OCR technology because, well, for one, it was a, uh, over a year ago, and to be perfectly honest, we feared that technologies at that point just weren't going to get us high enough confidence results to make a meaningful difference in the data entry experience. You know, for things like the FRAC details, it just wouldn't make sense at all. You really have to take a look at the information that's presented in those tables and kind of read what's there, understand what's there, and put it in the right field so it requires some, some skill to be able to do it. It's not a simple data entry task. Um, but, but, but even for other things, the technologies just, just weren't there kind of at the time frame we were looking at. And another factor was, frankly, time. We just really didn't have time to do a meaningful analysis of potential providers and, you know, third budget, and that always kind of bites you. Um, you know, today though, if, you know, if we were to, I think we actually could do some meaningful things by integrating, you know, like a technology like Ephesoft into the mix. And not, not for the FRAC details, of course, those, those are never really going to be viable for OCR, but perhaps for completions or certainly for other more simplistic forms. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me at all if another year from now there were actually an OCR um, component to their overall technology solution. Um, let's see, another question I have here is, uh, um, what if you don't have a dual monitor set up? Is there another way to more easily view the documents when indexing? Um, uh, great question. Um, yes, there's, um, this is actually just
just one configuration of indexing that I showed you. Um, there are actually other views that you can have that have both a document viewer and an editable version of the metadata on the same screen. So um, for DI, they didn't want that. Everybody had dual monitors, so they, they specifically wanted to be able to use a full screen just for the document and a full screen just for the metadata. So that's how we configured it for them. Um, most of our other clients that do similar kind of types of things don't have that luxury, um, and so they are working on a single screen, and so then we would do a different layout where they would have um, a narrower view of the document as well as kind of a narrower layout of the metadata. Um, and I highly recommend if you are interested in that, that you can, if you check out that webinar that I had listed on that, um, that other screen, um, it has, um, it takes you through several different use cases, I think all of which actually have the, um, have the metadata on the same screen as the, as the document. Um, there's another question we have here is, how are you tracking what has been done on the document? Um, well, I can answer part of that, and then, and then I'm going to let Joy speak maybe to another part of it. Um, so all the documents in these sites have a tracking data aspect applied, um, and it's really part of our automation of the system that every time a user interacts with the document, we're essentially stamping it with that information on who did what, you know, when, sometimes why, like in the case of that um, frac detail, not frac detail, the rejection use case where we um, have the error code that we populated into there. Um, so that's, that information is all read-only, um, from shares only modified by the system. Um, but we wanted to have it there, right there with the document, as opposed to being kind of in audit logs or something like that. We wanted that information there with the document so people could see it um, and use the system basically to find out that information about what had gone on with the document at any given time. Um, maybe, Joy, can you speak to, for a minute on how Drilling Info like, tracks information on an aggregate basis? Sure. Uh, in addition to that auditing information that we can view on each individual document, we also have a custom web script that allows us to extract information about what documents were updated or process, processed on any given day or date range. This is particularly important to us because in the event that we actually discover an error that somehow made it through the QC process to the presentation system, we go back and re-QC everything that person did that day. It also helps us in creating quarterly and yearly reports. You know, we got to look good to the bosses. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. I think we have a uh, time for one more question here. Um, which versions of Alfresco does that indexing thing come with? Um, it doesn't um, actually come with Alfresco. Um, that's a product that's available from Bluefish. Um, but uh, there are currently uh, versions that support 3.4, 4.0, and 4.1. Um, so um, I guess any of the kind of more modern versions of Alfresco um, is supported. Um, and you can um, certainly feel free to reach out for um, more information. Um, those are all the questions that, that I see right now. Um, if uh, you need anything else, please feel free to, to reach out at any time. Um, otherwise, I'm going to turn it back over to Joe for him to wrap up. Well, thanks, uh, Lisa, so much. Thanks, Joy, for the presentation. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, just a final note about, and, and uh, Lisa mentioned this earlier about DevCon. It is our um, our largest U.S. event. Uh, it is Alfresco's largest U.S. event that will be in early November. We'd love to have you there. And uh, just go to devcon.alfresco.com for more information. And uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to follow up uh, with me or with Lisa. But thanks for so much for joining, and uh, this, w this uh, session will be recorded, and the uh, recording will be posted to our website. So if you would like to have this uh, for other team members, you can access it there. Um, otherwise, that's all. So um, thanks for Bluefish and for Alfresco. Thanks for joining today, and uh, that this ends this session. Have a great day. Bye-bye.